Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. This is Dennis Prager's house. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a different way to introduce the opening. But yes, it's my house. It's a great opportunity to talk to you about anything on my mind and on your mind, because at least half of the fireside chat, which it literally is, is your questions. I wonder if I could take a moment of silence and can we hear Otto snoring? No. He was until I said that, but he's very bright and self-conscious. So if I announce that you might hear him, he stops. Oh, there it is. He started again. I want you to know it's very humbling to have a creature snore as you talk your heart out. It, it reminds you that, at least among some, you're not that scintillating. All right, be that as it may, so I, I I had a topic that I wanted to open up with, and I'm not going to do it, because I was told that a number of people regularly, right, regularly, roll right in, why is Dennis in a jacket and tie in his own house? So that's a very interesting question, and I want to talk to you about clothing, okay? I got a lot of thoughts on clothing. As it happens, I have a lot of thoughts on a lot of subjects which is pretty much my vocation, is to talk about a lot of subjects. But I think a lot. I've always thought a lot about these things. So let me dissect the question. Why is Dennis wearing a tie and jacket in his house? So if I did this in a TV studio outside of my house, would that be more understandable? I presume that that is an implication, right? In, in the question, because nobody wears a, a tie in, in their own house, let alone a tie and a jacket. I get that. I understand. But I'm not wearing it for me. I'm wearing it for you. Now, you may say, you don't give a hoot what I wear. And I believe that. I believe a lot of people, especially younger people, don't give a hoot. And if I showed up in a t-shirt, you know, theoretically, you would be just as interested Theoretically, what I have to say would be the same and just as important. But I was raised in a different America, and I, I am totally not self-conscious about saying, well, this is how it was, because sometimes how it was was better, sometimes how it was was worse, and sometimes how it was was just different. But sometimes, you have to admit, sometimes, that's why uh, you'll often see an ad, we make donuts the old-fashioned way. Well, why would they make an ad that would theoretically, right, that's the purpose of an ad, is to have you buy the product. Why do you care if a donut, wouldn't you want a donut made in a new-fashioned way? But they're obviously thinking that old-fashioned sounds good, that maybe there is something from the past that is worth keeping. So here's one of the things, I think there are better things today than when I grew up, but I also think that there were better things in those days. I think that the fact that people dressed far more formally in general life, you watch, for example, it'll blow your minds, watch, go on the internet and watch videos or still pictures of baseball games. We'll talk about churches in a moment, but, or oh, in schools, but look at baseball games all the men, the women were dressed in dresses, and the men were dressed in jackets and ties at a baseball game. Why did people do this? Everybody is more comfortable in a t-shirt, so why did they get into relatively uncomfortable clothing to go to a baseball game? Well, the answer is it wasn't for the baseball game. It was because they left their house. And there was a, there was throughout history until the 60s, in all of Western, in, in all of Western culture, there was the sense that if you went out into the public, you owed it to others to, it sort of honored other people to look nice. That was the thinking. You were dressing up, not for you, you were dressing up for others. And that is exactly the way it was perceived. People got dressed to travel. Uh, when I was a kid and we, you go on an airplane, everybody was dressed nicely. Today, there is no difference whatsoever between airplane travel and people's dress. 
and uh, um, going to the beach. People come in flip-flops, people come in shorts, people come in t-shirts, right? Uh, whatever is comfortable, they, they wear, and there's no self-consciousness about it. By the way, I understand this doesn't make a person good or bad. I, I'm just talking about clothing. I'm not judging people. I have no problem judging people, but this is not one of those occasions. I'm judging clothing. I'm judging the idea of, of looking good for others. So when I wear this, this is because I am on camera to uh, nearly a million people or a million people because I don't, the last one had 800,000 views. I don't assume every single person viewing it viewed it alone. Let's, so at least a million people are watching me now. That's, that's a lot of people. I mean, you know, the, the Rose Bowl or some major, major stadium has 100,000 people. So imagine 10 of these stadiums is, is viewing me now. That's a lot of people. And I feel that I owe it to you to look good, to look, to look formally good, that this is my subtle way of saying, this is a serious thing by talking to all of you, which is what exactly what it is. This is, is, this is a serious thing to appear before you. I, I think that's, that's an honorable thing to do. So, uh, I'll give you one. There are so many aspects to this that are so important and, and no one talks about it. It's just, it's a non, it's a non subject, but, uh, it's very interesting how often I fly virtually every week of the year. So I fly, uh, let's see, 52 times two is, so it's about a hundred. I, I must fly about 125 times a year. And, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, flight attendants will often comment on, on the fact that, you know, I, I like, I, I like your tie. I, I, I like, I like the way you look. Uh, it's a very interesting thing that they will comment on it. And I'll tell you another thing. I know this, that I'm taken more seriously. I'm also trusted more, uh, by the fact that if I'm on a plane, uh, and I don't wear a jacket, I, I wear, I wear a shirt and a tie. Uh, I, I know that th there is an immediate sense that this man's for real. Uh, it's, it's not easily definable, but I know it for a fact. And I know this for a fact. When they institute dress codes in schools, grades go up and violence goes down. Otto, thank you. He's adorable. This is, a, this is very important. All studies that I have read show that when, in, let's say in a high school or certainly in an elementary school, when there is a dress code, you have to dress. I had a dress code in my, in my uh, religious high school. Uh, the boys had to wear, maybe that's where I adopted it from. We had to wear, didn't have to wear a jacket, but we had to wear a shirt, slacks, and a tie every, every day. That was just assumed, and it made a difference. It said, we honor the school. You can't deny that it, there is no element. Look, I'll prove it to you. Look at how people dress for the Academy Awards. If clothing didn't matter, why do people dress up so beautifully for the Academy Awards? And I'll tell you why. Because they honor the Academy Awards more than they do schools or churches. That's why. All right, little fella. <laughs> okay. Maybe if I shake him just a drop. Otto, life is good, isn't it? Okay, he's snoring his way as a yes. Right? I mean, think about that. Why don't people go in t-shirts to the Academy Awards? It always strikes me as so worthy of, of analysis that people dress up so well. But why? If clothing don't, don't, doesn't matter, why do, you, why do you dress up? And it shows people dress up for what they value. People... If somebody went, if, if you got married and, and somebody showed up at your wedding in a t-shirt and, and, and shorts, would you, uh, forgetting a beach wedding, okay, at a normal wedding, at, at a country club, at a hotel, at a church, or the synagogue, the vast majority of people really dress nicely. Why? They're honoring the wedding. That's clothing honors the environment. Clothing affects the wearer of clothing. Ask people who put on uniforms how it changes them. 
Would you, a policeman wearing a police uniform, it, it changes his, his, re, re, the way he sees himself or herself, and they're right. Or, or, or uh, the captain of, of my flight. I, I wouldn't want my captain to, to be in a t-shirt and shorts. I, I would think there's something awry here. Wouldn't you think that? Do you care what your pilot wears? Do you don't want your pilot to wear a, a, a captain's uniform? We, we are fooling ourselves because we live uh, in the age of non-wisdom. There, there's no wisdom in our age. It's, a, it's, it's the age of foolishness. And the, I'll tell you, in a nutshell, one of the reasons is because people follow their feelings and there are no oughts, no shoulds. Just, hey, what do I feel like? What do I feel like wearing? I feel like wearing a T-shirt. I feel like wearing shorts. By the way, there are times I totally get it. I live in Southern California. I understand if people walking along the beach. I'll tell you, I believe me, if I went to the beach, I would not be wearing a tie and a shirt. Okay, just want to make it clear. I would be wearing a shorts or a bathing suit and a T-shirt. I, I got it. I totally get it. Okay? There are times where it seems silly, obviously, to wear something more... Uh, official, more formal, and so on. But it, it's a it's a big deal, and and there there is there is a loss in society, in my opinion, in in self regard and in regard for others. Where spend a week, it's a good experiment in your life. Spend a week wearing a nice shirt. You're a guy, a nice shirt and slacks, or a shirt and tie, even just one week. You're going to live, God willing, a lot of weeks in your life. See if that doesn't change uh, any of the way people react to you and the way you regard yourself. And if you're if you're a female, the same thing. You know, wear something uh, more formal, or even God forbid, a skirt, uh, and uh, you know, or, or or even a dress. I spoke uh, at Purdue University just uh, just recently, and uh, one of the um, one of the young girls, one, uh, you know, the college girls there who helped bring me there was, she was wearing a black dress. I mean, not a, not a wedding dress, just a black dress. And I, and I commented to her, I really love the fact that you wore a dress. Uh, it, 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 it just, um, it, 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 it said to me something about her. I thought, I thought it was a, it was a very appealing statement. Now, others may think it's irrelevant. You're entitled to that, but you know, it's not irrelevant because you know what you do dress up for. So uh, let's go to another example. I gave you the example of schools. That, that, that's the most dramatic. Violence goes down and grades go up when kids are told to, ha when there is a school dress code and they have to dress more formally. Everything we do affects others. Everything we do affects us. And it certainly includes clothing. Now, uh, the, the ultimate example uh, uh, is churches. I would say churches and synagogues, but interesting enough, this is one of the rare times where Jews are more conservative than others. Uh, very rarely in a synagogue do people come in a T-shirt and, and jeans. I mean, it, it's, I've spoken in, in hundreds of synagogues. It's, it's, it's almost unheard of. It, it's that rare. Almost always men wear a... Uh, a, a jacket and tie, or at least a tie and a shirt. I go in a tie and a shirt. And uh, it, 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 so you'll say, I get this line from Christians, good, good people, and I know they're good people. Then it's God doesn't care what I wear. He sees my heart. But it's not true God doesn't care what you wear. I don't. Why wouldn't God care what you wear? I think God cares about everything you do. <laughs> I don't quite understand that God doesn't care what you wear. Well, if you, if you wear better clothing to a, a Hollywood party than you do to church, then God made me does care. Like, why didn't you take the time to wear something nice in my house, uh, my house of prayer, as opposed to a, a Hollywood party? I, mean, you know, I live in Southern California, so I think Hollywood. But doesn't matter what it might be. Or, or even, or even you know, you're a lawyer and you go to work. Lawyers almost all wear, uh, the men wear shirt and tie. And the women dress up accor uh, accordingly. And uh, so why would I dress up to go to work but not to go to church? Because I honor work more than, more than I do prayer? 
more than I now if you could pray alone I'm not asking you if you pray alone I'm not asking you to wear a tie and a jacket in in your own home I get I, I get I totally get that you pray as you are as it were but that's the, but if you go to church it creates a community of 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 seriousness and it should be serious I don't, I don't mean devoid of humor I mean serious in the sense of important uh, the, now and now and now I'm told pastors are wearing jeans and and t-shirts what to show they're with it that's the last thing you want to convey to your uh, to your congregation that you're with it <laughs> and anyway you think that's going to attract people to the church if the pastor is with it it's the last thing people want is a pastor who's with it they want a pastor who's relevant they want a pastor who who has something important to say uh, who is a little special by the way is not just one of the people I'm sorry don't be a clergyman if you want to be just like the congregants. If you can't bear the responsibility of, I am different and I have to act a little differently, that's why I'm a rabbi, priest, or, or pastor, that, then don't go into the clergy. You are not one of the group. I'm sorry. And that's not what people want from you to be. We have, we have, you know, part of this clothing thing is the egalitarian French Revolution, egalitarian impulse of, you know, everybody's a fellow citizen and everybody's a comrade or whatever the term is. Oh, well, the priest or the, or the, the, well, the priest, Catholic priests and another priest, Episcopal, Episcopal priests, they have a uniform as it were. But, uh, but in Protestantism and Judaism, you know, uh, they, there's, there's no uniform. Uh, but you you are not one of everybody. You are you are special. Teachers too. Teachers should dress nicely. It's saying they honor the school, they honor the the students, they honor the environment, they honor the subject. It makes a very big difference. So that's why I do this. Okay, I could. I, it's no, it would be very interesting. Uh, I don't believe that if I sat here in a t-shirt and jeans, it would have the same effect. I don't believe that. And very few people uh, who are doing serious work in, the, in this arena uh, are doing that. Some are, and I get it. That's part of the, the zeitgeist, the spirit of our times. But it's, it's, not a, it's not a winning idea. So that's my case. That's my explanation. I, I thought it through. And uh, it has it has only helped me in my life. Not uh, it is not hurt in any way, and only helped. Okay, can I trouble you, Megan? Thank you. All right, to your questions. Uh, where was the first? Where was the first one of that Messiah, Messiah questions? Is that was the first? It was a couple down. Oh, it's a couple down. Fine, Gabe, seventeen. Northeast Pennsylvania, Stroudsburg. I know Stroudsburg. There's East Stroudsburg and there's Stroudsburg, if I'm not mistaken. I went to summer camp as, as a teenager in the Pocono Mountains. I know your area really well. Help! Exclamation point. Practically every student and teacher at my school believes the United States is a racist country. What do I tell them? It's astonishing that they think racism is an American value. I need some counter-argument ideas. Well, th this this will destroy the country. The, I, I have written about this, and you should read anything Larry Elder, who is black, has written about this, my friend and colleague, also has a national radio show with the Salem Radio Network, as I do. By the way, if you don't know that, I have a national show every day, three hours, and uh, it's, it's you can get it on the internet, you can get it on a local radio station uh, in, in most uh, cities. In any event, uh, Larry Elder has written a great deal about this, but I, I wrote, this is the greatest libel in modern history that America is a racist country. It, it, it is a lie, a defaming lie. This is the least racist country that has many groups in it. Uh, a Patterson, uh, what's this, Orlando. Orlando Patterson, black sociologist at Harvard, wrote that America is the least racist country with a white majority. And the, I don't know where black majority countries have had, uh, well, except South Africa, 
have had a non-black uh, population. So it, it's the least race. It's the least racist country in the world. People are spoiled in the United States. They don't know how good it is because they don't know anything about any place else. This is a statement of ignorance that America is racism. Compared to what? Everything is compared to what? It's like, are you healthy? Well, compared to what? If I have a cold, am I healthy? No, it's a fair question. If you have a cold, are you healthy? The answer is yes. You are a healthy person who has a cold. This is a, this is a non-racist country that has some racism in it. That's, that's the real answer. It is a non-racist country. Yes, there is some racism in it because racism in the human being is not perfect. So imperfect human beings will have flaws and they will manifest themselves in a whole host of arenas. But whom do you want to compare it to? Why did more black Africans come to the United States from Africa as free people than ever came as slaves? And that was true already in the 1970s or 80s. So it's been true for 40 years. Why do they come to a racist country? Why are they stupid? Why do black Africans want to come here? Why do they line up at American consulates? Because they know how well they'll be treated here, how much opportunity they'll have. A guy from Nigeria called my show today. And, and it, 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 it just reminds me of that. A, a, a Nigerian American. It, it's, it's the greatest lie and it, it, it's, it's, it's a result of ignorance and utopianism compared to some image of a completely non-racist place, America is really flawed. Yes, compared to a perfectly healthy person have, having, a, uh, having a cold or the flu makes you sick. But, but compared to the sickness that abounds in the world and has abounded in history, the early deaths that people, that people suffered from every disease... It's incredibly healthy time. Is America? You might want to. Why don't you say America's sick? I mean, in terms of literally physically sick. You know how many sick people there are. There are more sick people than there are racists. Black callers have called my show for years. Uh, on a cab, I have a lot of black listeners, and I'm very, I'm very pleased. I'm pleased to have all listeners. And anyway, uh, so whenever the issue of race comes up, the, the, the board fills with a lot of black callers. Black, call, black callers call in on other subjects too, obviously, but that one obviously elicits a fair number of black callers. So uh, very often this would happen. Dennis, you don't know how racist it is because you don't walk in our shoes. And that's true. I don't walk in anybody's shoes but my own. That's true. For that matter, I don't, I don't know what life is like for my wife. I don't walk in her shoes. I don't know what life is, life is like for my kids. You, you don't, I mean, theoretically, if <laughs> you don't know what life is like for, for anybody but you. But so I, so I say, fine. Okay. You're right. I do not walk in your shoes and I am white. Correct. So therefore, Dennis, they will say, you just don't know. We experience racism every day. It's a very common uh, call that I will get. So I've always asked the caller, well, in light of the fact that you experience it every day, tell me uh, what was the racist experience you had today? So in every instance, the person says, well, all right, not today. Okay. So I go, okay. And I'm not, I never ask questions to trap callers. I just ask them to challenge and to get clarity. So I said, okay, yesterday, never an answer. They don't have an example of yesterday's racist experience last week. So the, unless very few people call up and lie to me, so the, and, and they'd have to be very fast on their feet to lie on the spot. The truth is they didn't experience something racist. And by the way, if a non-black is, is rude to you, how do you know they're not rude to everybody? You, you understandably may assume it's because you're black, but watch, it, let's say if there's a clerk at, 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 at some, you know, fast food place in the airport and that person's rude to you and you're black, hang around 10 minutes and see how they treat the other people. If, if they scowled at you, and they were nice to everybody else. See how they treat other blacks. A lot of blacks at airports, because there's a lot of everybody at airports. See how they treat others. Hang around, you know, in the background. Just watch how the person's treating other people. It, it, it's it's a it it is so bad, wrong, and even evil to call this decent society racist. That it, it fills me with pessimism for the society 
to have a self-loathing that is undeserved. Are they racist in America? They're anti-Semites in America. But as a Jew, let me tell you, this is not an anti-Semitic country. I know there are anti-Semites here. Might even be more anti-Semites than there are actual anti-black racists. Anti-Semitism is the longest ongoing hatred in the world. But I, I have to tell you, as a Jew, I think I'm the luckiest Jew to ever live outside of a Jewish state. And, and, and that is to live in America. I believe that my whole life, and I believe that today. And I've written a book on anti-Semitism, and I taught Jewish history at Brooklyn College. So I know something about the subject. It's... Uh, Ask them for proof. What is their proof? Because there are so many uh, disproportionate number of black males in jail. Why is that proof of racism? Why isn't it proof that they commit more crimes? Nobody's ever answered that question. Why is that proof of racism? Ooh, either that may have really moved him. But that's but you can't say what I just said in a, in a typical classroom because you'll be called a racist for telling the truth that black males disproportionately commit violent crimes. But it's either true or not true. The question is, in, if it's not true, then it's a racist statement. If it is true, it's not a racist statement. But truth is not a left-wing value. The people who call this country racist uh, are on the left, and they, uh, they have indoctrinated your generation. And, it's a tra and, and the biggest tragedy is for blacks. To grow up thinking everybody around you hates you is like, is like being raised with child abuse. Kenley, 33, Akron, Ohio. On a past fireside chat, Dennis speaks a lot about parenting and raising kind, mature, and wise children. I'm 33 and single, no kids yet. What advice and lessons does, does he have on how to raise good kids? Thanks again. Keep up the good work. Enjoy it always. Thank you very much, Kenley. I have a, I have a lecture out how to raise uh, how to raise good children. It's at the Prager store. I'm always hesitant to mention it because it sounds like I'm trying to sell you a lecture. I promise I'm not getting rich on tapes on good children. Uh, in case you're worried, but uh, somebody has to man the store. They have to charge something. I think it's ten dollars. It's it, it's worth it's worth hearing. I I have developed this, and I'll I'll do a fireside chat on it. But I'll tell you how you begin. You begin by believing that the most important thing in your child is character, not grades, not athletics, not popularity, not quote unquote success, goodness. You begin by understanding people are not basically good. And how to make good people is the most important question any society can ask. And it isn't by just loving your children. Because if all you do is give your children love, you will have well-loved barbarians as adults. Children need uh, guardrails. That's what they need. More than love. And children need to learn that self-esteem self is far less important than self-control. All right. How, what's our time factor? Uh, 28. Oh, boy. So, all right, I'll do, I'll, I'll do this uh, transsexual one next time. Okay. And let's see, where is there it is? I'll end with this because I could give a pretty fast answer. Tyler, 28, Burbank, California. I am a Jew and I am fascinated with and study all three of the big Abrahamic faiths. Many Hasidic Jews believe that the Rebbe was the Messiah and Jews throughout time have th thought multiple people were the Messiah, yet they are still considered Jews no matter who they thought was the Messiah. Given that the Muslims believe Jesus was the Messiah, I don't think they believe he was the Messiah. They believe he was a prophet. I don't think they believe he was the Messiah. And that doesn't make them Christians. Why is it that any time any Jew claims to believe Jesus was the Messiah, he is labeled a, a Christian? Is this just due to dogma? Or is there something special about Jesus that makes him the only person a Jew cannot believe was the Messiah and still be considered religiously Jewish? So here's the answer. And this is a very interesting thing for you to know. 
The problem that Jews had with Christian faith was not the declaration that Jesus was Messiah. You're entirely right. Jews have believed at different times that different Jews were the Messiah, and Jesus was, of course, a Jew, a religious Jew at that, what we would call an Orthodox Jew. The problem was declaring that he was God. That was the big dividing line. If Christian theology only held that he was the Messiah, they would have probably stayed Jewish. And they simply would have been Jews, religious Jews, continuing as Jews who believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. And everybody would have gone on their merry way. The dividing line was the declaration that Jesus was God. That's different. And for that, there's no, there is no parallel. And Christians would acknowledge there is no parallel. No religion holds that about anyone else. I'm a big fan of Christianity, a big defender of America's Christians who founded the greatest country. But that is the issue, not the messianic, not the Messiah one. Good? Good. Goes fast. But that's good if it goes fast. That means you had a good time. He, on the other hand, I don't know if, if, if it went fast for him, but I guess when you sleep, life goes fast. That is true. Be that as it may, it is wonderful to be with you. Uh, do uh, send us your questions. What else can I ask you to do? Uh, okay, you can listen to my radio show. If you didn't know it existed, now you do. Tell people about these uh, these broadcasts, these pod, these video casts, this fireside chat. It's it's meant to touch people's lives, and I I hope it does. That's the only purpose of it ultimately. And I would like to remind you that. Uh, within just a few days, a few weeks, the second volume of my commentary on the Bible is coming out, The Rational Bible. It's, the, it's to my great joy, the best-selling commentary on the Bible in America today. And that is because I make it clear. It's the greatest book ever written, and, you, and it will give you rules for life. Like Jordan Peterson's wonderful book, 12 Rules for Life, the only difference is that I'm and, and I love that book, and I love him. He's going to be at the PragerU uh, Gala, and we're going to have a very wonderful dialogue. This is Rules for Life, but it's hundreds of them, because it's a, I'm basing it on such a big text. It's called The Rational Bible. And I will see you next week. In the meantime, I'll be at more universities. I hope I'll meet some of you there. Thank you for watching. I'm Dennis Prager. And God bless you. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, please do by donating to PragerU.